this work remotely. Belt, if you want. Oops, I don't think we really need. Oh, you're recording it down there. Yeah, we're recording it down there. Okay, so maybe keep the levels down. Yeah. Here, just put it in the pocket. Okay, so there are there are many classifications for it. Um, is that it breaks it into whether you've got toxic metabolic and the commonest cause of that in our jurisdiction is alcohol, and then idiopathic, um, genetic, and autoimmune. Now, these ones here cause the classical appearances of, of chronic pancreatitis, where you have calcification in the gland and a dilated duct. The tropical cause, which is, of course, very common in the Indian subcontinent, uh, causes dilation of the gland without calcification. And the autoimmune type here is usually small duct disease. So what happens? Well, you get ongoing alcohol abuse, and you, patients present with relatively asymptomatic periods, although they may be coming. This is, this is really the pathological changes in the gland where you get fibrosis, calcification. Um, it's only when they get to here that they start complaining of pain. Um, and there are two types of pain, short and episodic or unremitting pain. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And what's happening during this whole period of alcohol abuse and calcification and inflammation is that you're getting pancreatic duct obstruction, parenchyma hypertension, encasement of sensory nerves, and inflammation. And this is what's called a necrosis a fibrosis sequence, where the patients present with episodes of acute pancreatitis, and all the time there's a degree of pancreatic damage which is increasing until you get to a stage of developing chronic pancreatitis. They have pain. They have excrement insufficiency and they have endocrine insufficiency. Now, this doesn't happen overnight. It happens over a, 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 a quite a considerable period. So we'd see them in the hospital coming in with, with recurrent attacks of pancreatitis. Their main complaint is pain. If you measure their excrement and endocrine uh, uh, functionality, it's relatively normal. They get to a, an intermediate phase, which is about five or 10 years after, after presentation. Pain becomes less of an issue. And what becomes more of an issue is the pancreatic insufficiency. They present with signs and symptoms of pancreatic insufficiency, 
And then they get to a late phase, which occurs about 10 years on, where they have the classical exocrine and endocrine insufficiency. Yeah, I think, yeah, you can, you can stop. You might as well. More. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's sometimes, generally, when, generally at this stage, we see them in the hospitals. They're coming in with acute pain. It's, they're presenting with acute pancreatitis. But I think if you, hold, if you hold the questions until the end, just write the questions down, because a lot of what, what, what if, if, I, if I, I have it covered um, at the end, the significance of chronic pancreatitis, and I think this is a very interesting paper that was published uh, a couple of years ago in the UE Journal. And what they did was they looked at a number of studies which had, lo had long-term follow-up. And, and first of all, the median survival from the time of diagnosis is 15 years. So you think of chronic pancreatitis as being a chronic disease, not really very important. Most people die, the median survival is 15 years, so it's like a, a it's almost as bad as breast cancer in terms of, of the prognosis. But the interesting thing is about 60 to 75% are due to extra pancreatic consequences of their diseases due to alcohol and smoking. So they actually get, end up with, with al uh, problems of alcohol uh, consumption. So, most people would think it's a challenging disease, it's an enigma, and most patients remain symptomatic despite medical, endoscopic, and surgical therapy, and nutrition is a problem area for us. Now, this is our own data from Dublin, and this is, I, I spent, I came back to Dublin in 2003, and we decided to look at, and I'm, I'm a surgical oncologist, so I'm a cancer surgeon, and I was in a situation where we were seeing about 140 patients a year being admitted to our unit with pancreatitis. And so I was interested, I have three young daughters, and I was very concerned with this whole concept of, I was seeing a lot of, of alcohol um, uh, uh, patients coming in with, with pancreatitis. And what we saw over the period of 97 to 2004, and unfortunately, we've now about to publish data from 2004 to 2012, and this is continuing, this curve is continuing going this way. There was a 54% increase of people coming in with pancreatitis. About a quarter were alcohol related, but the interesting thing, alcohol patients were younger patients, and the scary, the thing that scared me most, that albeit from a small number, we were seeing a tenfold increase in young women coming in with alcohol. Now, I know the UAE will be different, but in Ireland we have a, a significant issue with binge drinking and drinking um, alcohol, which is significant, and you'll see what, what, what effects that has had on chronic pancreatitis. So this is in the current issue of pancreatology from our group, um, and my PhD student, uh, Hazel uh, Nikonabar, um, um, has done the first uh, prevalence study in Ireland. We took administrative database, which covers all of the acute hospitals, 100% of the acute hospitals in the country, and we found a prevalence of between 11.6 and 13 per 100,000, and I'll put that into perspective in a moment. What was interesting to us was that alcohol was not the predominant cause, and we were, we were a little bit surprised about that. There was, there was considerable um, regional variation, and there was, it appeared to be um, worse in the, in the western part of Ireland, which is in the rural part of Ireland, which would be the socially deprived part of Ireland as well. So Ireland is an island off the, off the, off the western coast of Europe, and this suggests to us that there was a social element to this. Now, when we looked at it, we saw over the years between 2009 and 2013 that there has been an increase. Um, we also showed that, as, as we would expect, it's, it's, it's a relatively young disease. The, the median age is, is, is in, the, in the low 40s, um, and you've now got 57% uh, of patients are presenting between the ages of 45 and 64 years of age. So this is about a decade younger than other, other areas in Europe. Now, if you put it into perspective, and this is a very detailed um, study from, from Hazel's paper, which shows Europe, the United States, and Asia. Uh, there's no Middle Eastern studies in, on this, incidentally. And what it shows is that our figures, and, and these are various different, these are either from patient records, they're either from administrative databases like ours, or they're from surveys. And if you look at our figure between 16 and 13.4 per 100,000, it's very similar to the, to the Danish study, uh, which is uh, from Denmark, uh, which used the same type of, of database as we did. The higher figures down here are from Japan, and they are very high from, from 28 to 52, 
uh, per 100,000, but they're surveys, and they are always overestimate the, the prevalence of the disease. So we think that this is a, a relatively high prevalence uh, for the thing. So how do you diagnose the disease? Well, as I mentioned before, most patients will present with abdominal pain, and the point has been well made that many of those patients will, may be seen in primary care and not getting into hospital. The pain is usually atypical pain, and so therefore most general practitioners will actually refer them into us. Um, it can be diffuse, it may be referred uh, pain uh, from the pancreas up into the chest or down to the throat. It's usually deep-seated, it's usually unresponsive to the first care. So when they present to their GPs, they're usually given antacids, H2 blockers and PPIs uh, because it's thought to be gastritis. Uh, it's clearly worsened by alcohol or eating and it very often requires opiates. So it's a considerable pain and there are two types, there's the episodic pain or the continuous pain. And the majority of patients will present with the continuous type of pain. Now, I apologize for showing my pathology slides, but anyway. Um, this is, so if you think, I agree with Dr. Gardner a couple of years ago who said it must be our goal to accurately establish the diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis at an early stage to allow us to have an effective treatment. Um, and you want to get, remember this is, this is the, the islet cell surrounded by fibrosis. Um, but however, if the problem we're faced with is if you go for early diagnosis, you're, you may overdiagnose the patient and therefore there are limited, we have limited effect of some therapies and what has been, has been stated particularly from the non-surgical community, and I'll talk a little bit about early surgical intervention in a moment, um, is that the intervention for early pancreatitis is risky. So what do we do? Well. Early diagnosis is a laudable goal, but there's a paucity of data confirming any impact on, in, in, on um, natural history. So the gold standard for a diagnosis is actually pathological biopsy, but it's very uncommon to be done. It's rarely available. What you find is a bland fibrosis with, with, uh, with atrophy and inf with fibrosis and atrophy without inflammation may actually be part of the normal process, although this appearance here is not normal. And it's not normal, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think it's normal from, from a process. So how do we make the diagnosis? Well, we have a stimulation test which we use infrequently, biochemistry is unhelpful, and we really look at structural tests, and what I mean by that is, is x-rays and are looking at uh, fecal fats. So the laboratory tests for majority of our patients, amylase and lipase is usually normal, FBC, LFTs are normal. Um, impaired glucose tolerance and fasting blood glucose is, is a presence, and if you think about it, if we're saying that part of the definition is that they have endocrine insuffi uh, insufficiency, then you'd expect that. As a screening test, we look at uh, glycosylated hemoglobin, hemoglobin A1C, and we measure hemoglobin A1C, and it's very often abnormal. We very rarely do fecal fat uh, estimation. In our hands, it's almost impossible to do. The patient has to have a a, a fat diet for three days beforehand, then collects the stool for three days and it's measured. Um, even if the patient does everything well, getting our technicians to measure the fecal fat, you can get them to do it once, they won't do it a second time. It's, it's, it's very, very difficult. And so we rely on fecal elastase, which is not great, but we define a fecal elastase. The, the, the advantage of fecal elastase is it isn't interfered with if you give them pancreatic enzyme supplementation. Um, and so what we do is so a, a figure of over uh, 200 uh, units per gram is normal and less than 100 is severe pancreatic insufficiency. Um, we don't do the Sudan staining which tests for fat if patient has steatorrhea and we rarely do serum trypsinogen levels um, and occasionally we'll do a secretin as a stimulation test or we'll do a secretin MRCP as you'll see in a moment. The key to the diagnosis is the CT scan, and this is a classical, this is an axial image for our medical student here. This is, this is the, the, a CT scan, so the patient's head is behind the screen and the feet are coming out to us. And this is uh, the liver, this is the spleen, this is the uh, left kidney, right kidney, and this is, this is an arterial phase because you can see the contrast in the aorta. This is the hepatic artery, this is the left gastric artery, or sorry, splenic artery, and then this is the calcified pancreas here. You can see dilated pancreatic duct and multiple calcifications. So we've got atrophy of the pancreas, we've got a dilated pancreatic duct, and we've got pancreatic class, uh, calcifications. And these are classical features of uh, the CT. And they're really present in hereditary pancreatitis, a, a loss of, uh, sorry, gain of function in the PRSS1 mutation, or in patients who are smokers and drinkers. 
and on the Indian subcontinent in patients who have uh, tropical uh, pancreatitis. This is a very interesting patient of mine who clearly had uh, recurrent acute pancreatitis. She had exocrine and endocrine dysfunction. She was in consistent pain. And this again is her, her this is now a portal vein uh, slide, so the aorta is not as, as, as well imaged. Here you can see the, the, um, the portal vein. This is the vena cava, left renal vein, pancreas here. This is the superior mesenteric vein, superior mesenteric artery here. Left kidney, right kidney spleen. And you can see the pancreas here looks full. Uh, the pancreas there looks full. Uh, but there's no calcification and there's no dilated duct. So the first thing is you think that this could, could this be autoimmune pancreatitis, uh, either type 1 or type 2. Her IgG4 levels were normal. And uh, we felt that she, in fact, had uh, what we call small duct disease. So conceivably, she could have type 2 um, autoimmune pancreatitis. Um, with a normal IgG4 level, but this is very, very typical of what we call small duct disease. And in chronic pancreatitis, about 10 to 15 percent of our patients will not have the classical signs that I showed you in the previous scan. We use MRI as well, and this is just an MRI showing dilated uh, duct uh, with all the little side branches. And then this is another example here of the dilated duct coming down. And in a patient here, it doesn't project well, but you can see a normal duct it doesn't project at all. Um, but what this patient has is pancreas diffusum. Um, now, we use endoscopic ultrasound very commonly, and we get our, our gastroenterologist to, to do a thing called the Rosemount criteria. Now, for the, for the medical student in the audience, this is, this is a, a test that everybody uses, um, and it's a very subjective test. It has a sensitivity of le around 70%. It is quite specific. And if you take the Rosemount criteria and it breaks it down into four things, consistent with chronic pancreatitis, suggested with chronic pancreatitis, indeterminate with chronic pancreatitis, and normal. So what are the, ma and it has major and minor features. The major features are that you have hyperchoic foci and lobularity, or you've got calculi. So if you have th uh, three, uh, uh, two major features, it's consistent. And the minor ones are very subjective stranding, lobularity, irregular contour, dilated side branches. You know, these are relatively uh, independent, are operator dependent and can vary between various different operators. Um, in order to try to make it more objective, we also use an uh, elastography, or we're beginning to use elastography. And what this basically does is it tests the stiffness of the tissue. So here we have a so if you have the pathological processes where you have the fibrosis and the, the, uh, the uh, loss of, 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 of uh, function, you can imagine the gland becomes stiffer. It becomes really hard. And when you operate on those glands, it's like operation on the table. It's really, really hard. So it becomes stiffer. So this is a normal picture. This is an abnormal picture. And you get this diffuse honeycomb appearance. And so you end up getting a, you can get a color map corresponding to the stiffness of the, of the tissue. And if you do that, you can actually have a relatively good approximation of functionality. So the group that's done most of this work is a group from uh, under, under Juan uh, Dominguez Munoz in Santiago de Compostela, which is in the western part of Spain, in Galicia. And they had 115 patients with chronic pancreatitis. And they measured, they did a functional test, which is a triglyceride breath test for functionality. And what they found was they had, they had a group of patients who were the classical chronic pancreatitis with, uh, with enzyme insufficiency, a little bit older than, as I, as I mentioned, the Irish population, mostly male, not so many females, um, had of the Rosemann criteria, they had seven criteria between major and minor, um, but, and the majority were diabetic and the majority had calcifications. Now, they had a group of patients who they compared it also had, who didn't have, P, have enzyme insufficiency. And you've got to wonder about the diagnosis here, although a number of them had calcifications, but none of them were diabetic. But it was based on EUX, and that's where the problem is, because did these patients have uh, um, uh, uh, chronic pancreatitis? Irrespective of that, when they looked at the pancreas function as measured by the, the triglyceride breast test, they found a, a, a negative correlation between the presence of fibrosis and, uh, and chronic pancreatitis. So in other words, if they became less elastic, they were more likely to have chronic pancreatitis. And what was interesting was the, 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 um, when they looked at calcified pancreatitis versus non-calcified pancreatitis, there really was no difference. So 
saying that, that a lot of these patients had small duct disease as well. So that this test is a reasonable test, they felt, for, for uh, diagnosing chronic pancreatitis. Now, this was published a couple of years ago, and I thought it was reasonable because it's basically what we do. So we have patients who come with pancreatitis, we see them in the clinic, we do all the laboratory investigations, and then we send them for a CT scan. If it's abnormal, it's chronic pancreatitis. If it's equivocal or, or not abnormal, we go on to MRI, and then we'll move on to endoscopic ultrasound uh, coming down this way. And, and this, is, this is our algorithm here. If it gets down here and, and that's normal, uh, we, we look for other diagnoses. Um, so basically, it's, it's examination, it's CT, it's MRI, it's endoscopic ultrasound in that order. As I was putting this talk together, I came across this paper in, the, in one of the most recent issues of the Journal of Gastroenterology, and it's from the Japanese group, and it is now the Japanese uh, practice guidelines, which were published last year in Japanese and, and in a, two months ago in English. And I thought it was interesting because it, it, it's rather simple. And so what it says is patients who are, you suspect having chronic pancreatitis, you do a history and physical examination. If they've got the classical imaging fe features that definitely say pancreatitis, like that first CT I showed you, then they have pancreatitis. However, if there's a probable finding, you're now into this thing. They have recurrent abdominal pain. They have enzyme levels which are abnormal. They have ab abnormal um, uh, exocrine function. Um, are they continuing to drink? And then you say, okay, you've got these four, so you've got two of the four, you're definite. If you're more than two, you get, and so you can go between definite, probable, and early uh, CP. And if they have none of them, then you've got to consider other diseases. So it's a reasonable thing to say, okay, do they have chronic pancreatitis? The problem with both this and our approach is we're diagnosing people when they have the disease. And your, your, your ability to impact on their natural history is relatively limited. So what are our goals in management? Well, if they have pain, you want to manage the pain. You want to remove the causes of their agents, such as alcohol or smoking, and then if they have complications of pancreatitis, and I haven't really gone into those, such as pseudocysts, forming fistula, duodenal or biliary obstruction, pancreatic ascites or, or veins, you need to deal with that and correct the pancreatic insufficiency, malabsorption, diabetes. Interesting, we see very little fistula. At this moment in time, um, on Sunday, I had a patient who I last saw two weeks ago who was, um, had been diagnosed with chronic pancreatitis in September. He had a number of attacks of recurrent pancreatitis. We scanned him in uh, September and he had some calcifications in the gland. Um, his fecal elastase has come back under 100 and his hemoglobin A1C is at the upper limit of normal. So we made a clinical diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis. And I saw him two weeks ago and he was well and we were starting the discussion about how we're going to manage him going forward. And he came into the hospital on Sunday, acutely unwell, with um, um, severe abdominal pain, and a CT scan showed that he had air in his pancreatic duct. Calcified in the head of the gland, but air in the pancreatic duct. So he's undoubtedly developed a fistula between his pancreatic duct and his uh, duodenum, which is unusual. He has, his head of the gland was, was quite, quite um, inflamed. I saw him on, on Monday morning before flying out here. He had improved somewhat on antibiotic therapy, but, and we're giving him enteral nutrition. Um, and so it's, it's, the issue is now what to do with him, because he is now, this is, these, are, these are difficult patients. They can be very sick, um, and they can end up with, with, with quite severe uh, pancreatic infection. Now, what's happened to us over the last five years is that we have now understood that the pain that you get in, pa in pancreatitis is not simply due to ductal obstruction. Um, it is predominantly actually a neuropathic pain. So the patients, in some patients you have to, in, just by relieving the ductal obstruction will help their pain, but not in all patients. And the patients that usually benefit from a surgical procedure, and I'll show you some examples of that in a moment, are the patients who have alcohol as the cause of their pancreatitis. And this is just, um, this is now from, from a German group, um, 211 patients. What they showed was that if you had uh, 78 patients with alcohol pancreatitis, very few of them had no pain. About uh, a third had mild pain and two thirds had moderate severe pain. If you contrast that in biliary pancreatitis um, or in idiopathic pancreatitis, the majority of patients either have mild or no pain. And that's very interesting because it's this group of patients that will benefit usually from a surgical procedure because they have dilated ducts. The rest of them, it's very equivocal. 
And it's because the pain is really a mixed type. There's a central element to it, there's a spinal element to it, and there's a neuropathy or a pancreatic uh, nociception. And there's a whole lot of different causes as to why they should get that, that type of pain. And so therefore your treatment has to take into account. So if you believe that there's the local oxidative stress, you've got hypertension, you've local inflammation, you've got this, this, this problem with the neuroplasticity in, in, in the gland, nociception going up the central receptors has changed. How you actually manage this is you use a WHO analgesic ladder starting with very non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, paracetamol non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and moving through the narcotic analgesics. Uh, but we're inclined also to use gabapentin and tricyclic antidepressants as well in these patients. Uh, we don't use antioxidants based on the ANTICIPATE trial, which was a negative trial, as you know. So we're inclined to, to be, to be um, multimodal in how we actually deal with the pain, giving patients things like Lyrica as well as tricyclic antidepressants as well. Now, as I mentioned in the onset, we, we as a group are, are interested in the nutritional management of pancreatitis. These patients are nutritionally very vulnerable, and it really does require a multidisciplinary and I would say an interprofessional approach to how we manage them. The areas that we focused in are bone health, diabetes management, and this whole concept of, of micro and micro nutrition or uh, supplementation, as well as enzyme uh, supplementation. Now, this is a busy slide, but what it basically says is that there are many causes for uh, nutritional uh, or undernutrition in pancreatitis. We know that the majority of these patients have an in increased rest in energy expenditure. One of the problems is, as I've alluded to, is many of these patients are, are taking excess alcohol. This is, a, this is a problem because not only is the alcohol causing damage to the pancreas, and we, we can go through that in, in the future if you want, um, but it displaces food, it affects appetite, and it causes a degree of malabsorption on its own, of course. And the problem then is, is alcohol leads to poor dietary intake, they also smoke, social circumstances are not good, they end up with a chronic inflammation, they may have diabetes, and then you, because of the, of the damage to the pancreatic uh, islet cell, or sorry, acinar cells, and, uh, you end up with, with insufficient uh, pancreatic lipase, you get malabsorption, malabsorption, you get undernutrition, and that leads to a spiral into weight loss, vitamin deficiency, osteoporosis, sarcopenia, poor functional capacity, lower quality of life, and poor outcomes. So, if you think about patients who present, as a surgeon, I always thought that patients who presented with, with chronic pancreatitis are in their 60s, they're male, they smoke, they drink too much, and they are very thin, and they look eclectic. And of course, now what we're seeing is they're younger, not all of them will have, uh, take alcohol to excess, and um, they're actually increasingly female. So we were interested in looking at, at malnutrition, muscle mass, functional capacity, and we were looking at sarcopenia. And what we found in this study, which we published in Nutrition uh, in Clinical Practice two years ago, was that when we compared a, a group of patients who had, we did a case control study looking at patients who had chronic pancreatitis versus age, sex, and uh, nutritionally matched controls. And what we found was that chronic pancreatitic patients were not classically underweight. If you look at the BMI, in fact, of the patients, there were 26 uh, compared to control in the male population. Uh, this actually reflects Ireland in 2016. Ireland in 2016, the average BMI now is in the high 20s. Uh, we have a significant problem with obesity um, in, in the country. So many of our patients are actually obese. Now they're, they're high BMI, but when you actually look at, at their muscle mass, they're actually sarcopenic. So they have lower fat and muscle stores, and they have lower strength. Now, it was very interesting. We, we had uh, a situation in, in in my unit, which was a pancreas cancer unit, our laboratory was interested in, in, in ampullary cancer and to molecular um, uh, medicine. We were looking at angiogenic factors in, in, in ampullary cancer. And in 2008, the Irish government decided they were going to regionalize um, pancreatic cancer services. So my hospital was not designated as a pancreatic cancer center, even though we, at the time we were the busiest in the country. And so my research, uh, laboratory, I had a research laboratory, and we had to make a decision as to what we were going to do. And in December 2010, this is the major shopping street in Dublin called Grafton Street, um, and this is a very unusual occurrence for, for Ireland in, in December. We usually, it's usually wet, because we've got green grass, um, and this is snow, and it was a very cold day. And 
This patient appeared in the orthopedic ward with a fracture in the neck of femur. And you can see, you can see there, uh, intercapsular fracture in the neck of femur. And my nurse, my nurse uh, specialist made the observation that we were seeing not only this patient, but we were seeing other patients appearing in the, in the orthopedic wards with uh, fractures uh, of their wrists and, and other uh, lower limb fractures, mainly because Irish people are not used to snow and they were sliding and slipping and falling. And so we asked a simple question about what was the, what was the range of osteoporosis and osteopenia in the literature, and I sent a medical student off to do this work, and I came back with a figure of about 35% in terms of osteoporosis and osteopenia. So we said, okay, this is interesting, and we've seen a lot of these patients, we should ask a question, and the question was, what's the instance in, in the Irish population? So this is an article that we published two years after that in pancreas, and again, another case control study where we took 53 patients with chronic pancreatitis, and again, matched them to 59 patients who had uh, who are normal patients. And what we found surprised us. With regards to osteoporosis, we found in 9% in the, in the control patients, which is about the correct figure for the Republic of Ireland. Our, Ireland is uh, at 52 degrees north, um, doesn't get an awful lot of sun, it rains quite a lot, um, but this was the figure in our chronic pancreatitis. This is osteoporosis, not osteopenia. Um, and what we found was that patients with chronic pancreatitis appear younger. We kind of knew that. They have considerable exocrine and endocrine insufficiency. They require frequent hospitalization, and they have significant social consequences of their disease. They're more likely to be out of work. They're more likely to be divorced. They're more likely to be in requiring as, um, social housing. And we thought that the instance was actually increasing. So we found that osteoporosis was three times higher than controls. It was higher in smokers. And the interesting thing is, is once you hit 37 years of age, it didn't increase. So the incident, the, the, the problem was happening early. And the really frightening issue for us was there was no gender dif dif difference. We were now getting to a stage where we were seeing patients who were female with uh, chronic pancreatitis compared to controls. And when we actually added the osteoporosis to the osteopenia, we found that rather than 35% overall figures of having a uh, difference in bone uh, uh, mineral density, our figure was nearly 80%. It was 79%. And this, this, this prompted us to do a meta-analysis, which we published a couple of years ago. And our study's up here. Um, the prevalence was in the, in, in the case control study was 73.6%. And we compared it, the, the more recent literature, this is a 39% from the Czech Republic, which is the figure that our medical student quoted. But what we're seeing is now that it's now recognized that about two out of three patients diagnosed with chronic pancreatitis in the last decade actually have bone health problems, which is actually quite significant. So we asked the question, why? So this now all came from an observation that one of my nurses made in a snowy weekend in Dublin. And we asked the question, why? So this is a paper we published last year in the American Journal of Gastroenterology. And what we found was an association between abnormal bone turnover and systemic inflammation. And we're the first group to have shown that, that um, uh, linkage. So what we did is we, we, we found that there was abnormal bone metabolism, that the, that the, the bone turnover was increased. It was both osteo, uh, the, 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 the bone resorption and uh, production was actually increased. And what we found was that patients who had the lowest vitamin D had the highest inflammation, and the lowest bone density had the highest inflammation. And when we looked at patients who had a low bone density, we found that they had high levels of IL-6. They also had highly specific um, CRP. So what we were, as I say, we're the first group to have identified a potential relationship between bone uh, uh, mineral density and systemic inflammation. But this is not terribly surprising because it occurs in other diseases that many of you are familiar with, such as inflammatory bowel disease, such as Crohn's disease. Um, so what we feel is that the loss of bone uh, mineral density is in part driven by systemic inflammation along with a low vitamin D, smoking, and malabsorption. So this has prompted a number of other groups to look at this, and, and our work is actually, it's very nice to, to come out with a, with, with a statement first and have other groups support it. And this is now from uh, last month's pancreatology, 
uh, with a group, uh, Rash and colleagues have suggested that we have a, a, what they call an infamy gene phenotype. That if you get the chronic inflammation of malabsorption, pain, and poor nutritional status, and you have a system, systemic chronic, chronic inflammation, and other groups like us have shown that IL-6 is in, in, increased, as well as some of the other markers of, of inflammation, such as uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and there's decreased uh, ones of, of the basis. And that what you get is a loss of total body weight, osteoporosis, and sarcopenia, all of what we see in chronic pancreatitis. So chronic pancreatitis is now recognized as an inflammatory disorder, which really is analogous to the increase in biological aging. So I suppose it goes back to the first, one of the first slides I showed, was that one of the problems with biopsy of pancreas is that we don't know whether it's part of the natural aging. And what we think is happening is we're accelerating the biological aging in, in patients with chronic pancreatitis. So why is this important? Well, a German group, uh, sorry, a, a Danish group showed that compared to controls, um, there is a higher rate of any fracture in chronic pancreatitis, and especially in patients with alcohol. The Americans have shown the same. This is a study that was published in Pancreas last year, which has looked at chronic pancreatitis uh, versus controls. And it's higher total fractures, vertebral fractures, hip fractures, or wrist fractures. Now, we know that once you have a fracture and once you end up in hospital, it becomes a considerable economic burden. Um, there's a considerable mortality and morbidity. And it's very interesting that particularly in patients who are older, that there is a hip, hip fracture mortality and most deaths occur within the first six months. So osteoporosis affects quality of life, even in the absence of vertebral fractures, decreases the amount of mobility, and it's largely preventable. Now, I was looking at this last night, and it says no guidelines for bone health. We actually have written by guidelines, but there's very few guidelines for, for bone health. This is what we wrote in gastroenterology last year, or sorry, two years ago, which is basically we are very active in using DEXA scans, as I'll show you. Um, we, have, uh, we have a, depending on whether the DEXA scan is, is normal or whether it shows uh, osteoporosis, we will, we will either give uh, uh, calcium, we will give vitamin D, and we may give biphosphorus. But we're very active in terms of how we actually manage it. We're also interested in this, this whole concept of the macronutrients uh, deficiencies because we believe that, that there are, if, you, if you have poor diet, if you're increased requirements, if you have malabsorption, you're going to have a deficiency. And we know from our own uh, case control studies that in Ireland, there is a high level of both vitamin E and vitamin A deficiency. Vitamin D deficiency is, is, is higher than the control populations, but I think reflects in part the malabsorption, but it also reflects the fact that we're a high latitude uh, country. So what do we do? Well, we take patients who have weight loss, maldigestion, um, and we believe that, that they should have pancreatic enzyme uh, supplementation. We've done another, a number of studies of our, of our general practice colleagues, and we now know that, that PERT is very under-prescribed under in general practice. And so this is our, our current uh, guideline. If, we, if there is, if it's a low fecal elastase, uh, we give PERT. We usually give between 40 and 50,000 with each meal. You probably should be having about 70 to 90,000 uh, international units of lipase with each meal. Um, if the patient responds clinically, and what we mean by that is the atorrhea goes, that they, that, they, that they feel better, we, we continue with that. If not, we, we increase the dose. We may add um, a PPI to decrease uh, gastric acid secretion. And occasionally, we, we will give something like loperamide uh, to decrease um, uh, bowel transit time. The other thing we've been now more aware of is this whole concept of diabetes and, and the management of diabetes uh, with patients with, uh, with um, uh, chronic pancreatitis. I think if I asked my own medical student class to classify diabetes, they would tell me that diabetes is type 1, which is insulin dependent, or juvenile diabetes type 2, which we see an awful lot of because of the obesity crisis in, in, in the Western world, and particularly in Ireland, um, and they'd stop. And I'd say, what about type 3C? And I'd get this blank look. And what we have, what we have seen is, is that there is a third type of diabetes. It is this pancre pancreaticogenic diabetes. And it's, it's frequently misclassified. Uh, you patients will get hyperglycemia due to suppressed uh, glucose production and hypoglycemia. And it's particularly difficult to uh, manage 
because of poor diet, malabsorption, pain, smoking, and alcohol. And if you think about it, when we have a patient who is a diabetic, even an insulin uh, uh, dependent diabetic, type 1 diabetes, they're going to have the counter regulatory hormones, glucagon. If you have a disease which is wiping out your islet cell production, you're going to lose not only the insulin, but also the counter regulatory hormones. So you really truly have a brittle type of diabetes. And that's exactly what we have in this situation. So these are very hard to manage. Uh, a couple of years ago, we wrote some guidelines for it in terms of just very simple things to patients not to skip meals, to take frequent meals. We get them to, we send them out with glucometers to measure their glucose. Avoiding alcohol is very important, and I'll come to this again. Uh, we r make sure that they're taking enough enzymes, and we, we keep them under very close uh, dietetic control. Now again, for, for the students in the audience, if you look at in, in, in a Western population like the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom, the distribution of diabetes is mainly type 2 because of our, of our I think because of our, of our weight issues. Type 1 occurs in about 12% and type 3 occurs in 8%. But if you look at type 3 and take that out, 76% of these patients, three quarters of these patients have chronic pancreatitis. So it is significant. And again, we looked at this in, our, in, our, in, a, in a smaller study of patients and we found that the prevalence of type 3 diabetes is 33% versus 3% in controls. So this is a significant element of how we have to manage it. Uh, Sinead Duggan, who is, who is my postdoc uh, researcher and in charge of our laboratory, um, has now, is now with the uh, European uh, Diabetic uh, Group is writing guidelines for how to manage type 3 diabetes. And what we see is these patients are have, have an element of type 2 diabetes, an element of type 1. They're usually uh, underweight, uh, which is interesting. They have ins they're insulin sensitive. Um, hypoglycemia is common, and it can occur at any, at any age. So we're, we're now very aggressive in how we actually manage this, this, this population of patients. So this is a detailed slide. I just want to go through it. We wrote it a number of years ago. It's, it is basically our practice in terms of how we actually manage the nutrition of these patients. If they make a diagnosis, we have a, a multidisciplinary committee. And this is incredibly important. We feel that the management of these patients is multi-professional. It includes, um, it includes the, the, the physicians, it includes the dieticians, it includes the pain specialists, it includes our social workers, it includes our physiotherapists in terms of exercise tolerance. We try to give them exercise programs uh, going forward. Uh, we measure anthropy, uh, anthropometry and dietary assessment. Um, we have nausea, and we go through all the bits and pieces. I just want to focus on the bone health here, because if the DEXA is normal, we just go through the exercise program, basic bone health programs. Osteopenia, we repeat the DEXA every two years. Osteoporosis, uh, we, we, we have a bone specialist referral uh, process in which we give them basically calcium, uh, vitamin D, as well as biphosphonates. And so this is a very aggressive program. It's, it's a, it's, it is a resource-intensive program. But what we have shown is, is it has changed the disease from an inpatient disease to an outpatient disease. And we're inclined now to, to, to have an outpatient uh, management of these patients. And in fact, what we've actually done is we've created a nurse-led clinic that sees these patients. So it works actually very well. Now, I'm a surgeon. And I have to talk a little bit about surgery in terms of this disease. So when do we use surgery or when do we use endoscopy? Endoscopic treatment has been, has been used for many years to deal with bile duct obstruction, duodenal obstruction, and pancreatic duct strictures and stones. And there's been a whole number of, of, uh, of, um, of, of procedures, such as, as main pancreatic duct sphincterotomy, pancreatic duct stents, of course, biliary stents as well, and then extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy to, to, to uh, break up stones within the duct. Um, it's also been used for complications, and this is one of our recent patients who uh, presented with, with duodenal obstruction secondary to this very large pseudocyst. Again, this is the liver, this is the spleen kidneys, this is the stomach being displaced by the very large pseudocyst in the head of the gland. And um, our gastroenterologist very, very expertly placed a drain um, from the, uh, uh, this is an endoscopic uh, pseudocyst gastroscopy using a plastic stent from the stomach into the uh, cyst with excellent results. And we're now quite aggressive in how we actually manage these, these, um, these pseudocysts uh, gastroent with gastroenterology. In the old days, this would have been a candidate for a, uh, pan uh, uh, either a laparoscopic or an open uh, cyst uh, enterostomy, which we don't do now anymore. Um, and, the reason, and, and the reason endoscopy is so successful is mainly for ductal stenosis and ductal stones. 
and there's been a number of studies going throughout the years. Uh, you know, a fair number of patients published. This is a pretty old paper, but it basically showed a 60% reduction in, uh, sorry, 60% uh, long-term improvements in pain and pain re re results. And because of this data in the 1990s and the early 2000s, it prompted the Dutch, who are an excellent, uh, uh, thoughtful group of, of, of endoscopists and surgeons and pancreatitis, to do a randomized trial. And you're all familiar with this trial that was published nine years ago in, in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine, which is endoscopic versus surgical drainage for pancreatic duct in chronic pancreatitis. And this is a very important and a very sensible trial, because it surprised everyone. It was Marco De Bruno's group, uh, along with the Jana Kahn, uh, and Marco is a gastroenterologist. The vast majority of people here are gastroenterologists. And it was said when they, when they, when they uh, arranged to do this trial that this trial was going to be a positive trial to show the effic uh, efficacy of stenting versus surgery. And to everybody's surprise, um, it didn't. So it's a small numbers of patients. They had 118 patients. 39 went, underwent randomization. Um, so there's basically 20 in each group. What they showed, and again, very surprisingly, was that surgery was better, this is the surgical patients, surgery was better than endoscopy in terms of reducing the pain score. And as you went from baseline to 24 months, it seemed to hold out. Also, when you looked at the various different uh, parameters, pain had decreased. Uh, the number of procedures the patients required um, basically was, from, uh, was decreased in terms of uh, surgery, three procedures versus uh, eight in the endoscopy. But what was intriguing to me when I read this initially was that not only did their quality of life appear to be improved, but their exocrine function appeared to be maintained or improved. And so the question I asked Jakob Zbicki at the time of this paper was, should we be operating earlier on patients with chronic pancreatitis? Now it's interesting, Cahan and the colleagues followed this up five, four years later with a follow-up study which suggested again that in returns of pain relief, the surgical patients, again, small, the few patients dropped out, but pain relief was well maintained in the patients who had um, uh, surgery versus endoscopy. And when you looked at exocrine and endocrine insufficiency, didn't read statistic significance, but what's apparent is is that the surgical patients appeared to be holding their own. These were, these, were, these were equivalent groups of patients at the beginning, but it suggested that surgery may have a, a long-term follow-up. This was published in the BMJ two years ago, three years ago now. Um, it was written by Steve Pereira from London, and basically what Steve was looking at was the total cost to the patients in the Cahan trial. So he took those trial, that, that randomized trial from, from the Netherlands, and he looked at this, and it showed a significant decrease in, in, in surgery. So what they said in obstructive chronic pancreatitis, surgical drainage highly cost-effective compared to endoscopic drainage from a UK NHS perspective. So now we had a randomized trial, albeit with relatively small numbers, which suggested that surgery is preferable to endoscopy in maintenance of pain and endocrine and insufficiency. And this trial has now, uh, I've seen the longer follow-up data and even now, at, in 2015, the data is beginning to hold up. So what are the indications for surgery in chronic pancreatitis? I suppose intractable pain, symptomatic local com complications like it's common bile duct obstruction, duodenal obstruction, pancreatic pseudocyst or pancreatic ascites. Now, many of these can be dealt with, as I said, endoscopically. On successful uh, endoscopic management, and I will deal at the very end about the suspicion of malignancy. So the question I've, I have struggled with is when do we operate? Do we operate early or late? Now there's a whole potpourri of surgical procedures going way back to the 1930s to when Whipple was doing pancreatic duodenectomies for chronic pancreatitis, all the way up here to Pusto doing a lateral pancreatic ejectionostomy. He actually described a distal pancreatic ejectionostomy, Parkinson Rochelle, a modified one uh, 50 years ago, and then here, the, this is interesting, this is now Sutherland reported in 1978, a total pancreatectomy and uh, islet cell transplantation from Minnesota. Um, and then the Bager Fry and the Isbicki procedures here, and this is just Gagne, I put that in because that was in 1994 doing laparoscopic procedures. So this open laparoscopic and this total pancreatectomy. So this is, this is the, the, the usual pancreatic odwadenectomy, 
that I do. You can either do a pylorus sparing or a hemigastrectomy. And the surgical options come, are, are written up here. So there's a resectional case where you're doing the pancreatic glottonectomy and you remove the head of the gland. There's the Parkinson Rochelle where you basically slice open a, a dilated duct. There's the Baker procedure where, where, the, where the head of the, the pancreas is transected along the portal vein and the head of the gland is basically uh, resected, preserving the duodenum. So it's a duodenal preserving pancreatic head resection in, in essence. The Fry procedures are a little less uh, aggressive and I'll, I'll comment a bit more about that in a moment. With, with the Parkinson Rochelle type uh, slit down here and a coring out in the head of the exam. This is the burn modification of the, of the Baker procedure where they don't divide the pancreas, they don't do a lateral thing, and they do this coring out of the, of the upper end very often with the pancreatic and biliary anastomosis. And this is the Isbicchio Hamburg procedure, uh, which is one I prefer, which is a V shaped resection of the tail of the gland and then a coring out of the head. So it's kind of it's a modification of the um, of the, uh, the Fry procedure. And then, of course, you've got total pancreatectomy and islet cell transplantation, which is done in about 20, maybe 25 centers worldwide. And there's been some promising results, but in very selective uh, procedures, and we don't do that. The advantages of taking it out and resecting the gland is that very often these patients, particularly with alcoholic chronic pancreatitis, have an inflammatory mass in the head of the gland. And very often it's, 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 um, it's unclear as to whether that can be malignant. So you remove the inflammatory mass. You, one of the reasons I think it's so successful is that you actually uh, selectively um, uh, separate the gland from the splanchnic nerves. You're almost doing a, a, a splanchnic nerve um, uh, uh, release procedure. And of course, it's an established procedure. In our hands, mortality of the pancreatic duodenectomy is less than 1%. We're very used to doing it. Disadvantage, long-term morbidity. Patients have a higher instance of developing diabetes if they haven't a diabetic. Um, you can get disordered digestive function. So it does have, have uh, downsides. The duodenal pr preservation, whether you do Baker or Fry, preserves the duodenal, enteric passage, um, improved pain control, and endocrine function is, is probably preserved. Disadvantage, particularly with the Baker, it's a complex procedure, and there's very often a need for reoperation if you're not aggressive enough in terms of taking the inflammation around the bile duct. Um, but it is a complex procedure. Now, there have been a number of randomized trials which have compared uh, pancreatic duodenectomy to Fry, so the classical Whipple versus pylorus sparing Whipple versus the Fry procedure. And in essence, what they show is no difference between them. If you look at the pain scores, again, preoperatively high decrease with both of them from 63 to 18, 62 to 17. Quality of life improves, goes up from 28 to 50, 28 to 58, no different. And when you look at the, 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 the exocrine and endocrine insufficiency, unfortunately, by at seven years, most of the patients are diabetic at some stage, maybe a little bit less so in the Fry procedure. What was interesting recently, uh, Karen Backman and colleagues uh, from Hamburg presented the, the, their, the, one of the randomized trial data, the long-term follow, 15 years follow-up, and whilst there was no difference in terms of symptom control, there was a difference in terms of overall survival. But the patients who had the limited uh, procedure uh, doing better than the patients who had the uh, pancreatic rodenectomy. And I wonder, does this reflect the, the greater uh, um, change in, in intestinal function that the pancreatic duodenectomy brings. It's intriguing. We don't really understand the reason for this. I'm inclined to use the Fry procedure because particularly if you have a degree of portal hypertension, but absolutely if you have a superior mesenteric venous obstruction and, and portal vein obstruction, this can be a hazardous operation. Now, I've done approximately 800, maybe 850 pancreatic duodenectomies in my career. Um, and, I, and I'm very comfortable taking the vein, I'm very comfortable taking artery, but this can be a tre treacherous procedure in patients who have a, lot, a very inflamed gland and a lot of uh, portal hypertension. So I'm more inclined to do the Fry procedure in those positions. If I have small duct disease, I will do the V-shaped procedure, which is a kind of a modification of the Isbicki procedure um, for, for these patients. And in fact, the, the the, um, and this is just opening up the gland and creating a kind of a trench so that you're getting, you're believing that you've got a small uh, duct hypertension and this, this relieves it.
I mentioned earlier on, alcohol cessation is incredibly important. So irrespective of what operation you do, irrespective of whether you do a resection or whether you do a fry or bag or are, are in this Vicky operation, if you don't get them off alcohol, they're going to do badly. And this is again Karen Backman's assessment of the long-term follow-up of the fry versus, versus pancreatic or duodenectomy. And what they showed is if you have, if the patient continues to drink, they're going to do worse in all basically these, these things. They're going to be worse emotional functioning, social functioning, global quality of life is going to be worse, and their pain is going to be worse as well. So you've got to get the patients off alcohol, and we spend a lot of time trying to deal with this. One of the problems of the economic downtime in Ireland in the, in the 19, 2009 to recent times is we lost a lot of, of uh, public funding for our social uh, health programs. And so we lost our social worker. And so what that meant is a lot of our patients started drinking again. And so alcohol cessation programs went, went out the window and we're seeing more and more patients back to clinic again. And we went to our administrators and our national uh, uh, service and said to them, look, this is ridiculous, we need to get this back. And unfortunately, it, it's, it's not one of their main priorities. So how do we do this and what's our current man management algorithm? So again, as I said, when you look at the, at the when we, we see the patients first, we treat them medically, we do a big assessment of their bone health, we try to correct the things we can correct, we treat their pain very aggressively with, with um, initially with non-narcotics and going up to narcotics, but we use um, uh, pregabalin and gabapentin, we use SSRIs and tricyclic and antidepressants. Um, if it's effective, we continue to follow them in clinic, and we have many patients that we're following in clinic now. If it's not effective, then we have to make a decision if they've got an inflammatory mass, we're inclined to go ahead and do, a, as I mentioned, either an Aspiki or a Fry procedure. If they have just a dilated pancreatic duct and, and ductal stones without an inflammatory mass, my own preference is to go ahead and do a um, Aspiki procedure um, or a V-shaped Hamburg type procedure. Uh, we haven't been doing total pancreatectomy with islet cell transplantation, although in my own institution now we have just developed a pancreas transplant program. And I suspect that this will come in in many years, in, in a number of years going forward to a selected group of patients. So we require a multidisciplinary team, and it really is gastroenterologists, I'm sorry about the spelling, endocrinologists, dietitians, etc. And these patients need to be followed up for life. Um, and the problem is, is because of this case, one of my patients from last year um, in Ju July, he, a patient who we've been following for, for about eight years with chronic pancreatitis, he came in with, with, with uh, duodenal obstruction. You can see the stent having been placed, or sorry, biliary obstruction. You can see the stent having been placed in. This was his gland. There was a suggestion of, of, of a mass. Um, and he had a rise in his liver function test. And this was the finding at endoscopy, this fungating mass. And a biopsy came back as adenocarcinoma. And this is actually a pancreatic cancer infiltrating into the duodenum. And we know that the mortality is about 38% higher for pan chronic pancreatitis in the, in the group in, in, than the common population. And the incidence for pancreatic cancer is about 1.5% per year. So there is, a, there is a significant increase. So not only are we now looking at these patients for symptom control, not only are we looking for endocrine exome control, we're trying to make sure that they don't actually develop uh, pancreatic cancer. So to allude to your question at the very beginning in terms of how should these patients be managed or where should they be managed, we believe that these should be managed in an outpatient center. We, are, we, we believe that these patients should be presented to a multidisciplinary team within a hospital setting, but then they should be referred back to primary care because primary care has a significant uh, input into their, into their management. And we're in the process of publishing guidelines now for primary care physicians within both the United Kingdom and Ireland, uh, which will hopefully help in, in terms of the management of, of this very difficult disease. Last week in, in, in Manchester at the Pancreas uh, Symposium, these are the people from my lab who all had presentations in, in the, uh, on chronic pancreatitis at that meeting. It's a major, influence, a major in, in interest of ours, and I wouldn't have been able to present you some of the work that we did without the, the uh, uh, real leadership of Sinead Duggan, who is, has been uh, my uh, nutritional uh, uh, expert going forward. So thank you for your, for, your, for your attention and I thought for the, for the last part we could now have a discussion and I could answer any questions about something I have said that seems a bit unusual or something I haven't said or maybe you could educate me on the prevalence and, and how you manage chronic pancreatitis within uh, the UAE.
So thank you very much.